When Jesus had again crossed the Sea of Galilee in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him. He was by the lake when one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her, so she may be made well and live. Jesus went to, with Jairus. A large crowd followed and pressed in on Jesus. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many, many physicians and had spent all that she had. She was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus. She said to herself, if I touch, but touch his clothes, I will be made well. She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Immediately the bleeding stopped. She felt in her body that she was healed. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said, You can see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? Jesus looked all around to see who had done it. The woman, knowing what had happened to her, came to Jesus, trembling with fear. Falling down, she told him what she had done. Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of this disease. While he was still speaking to her, some people came from Jairus' house to say to him, Your daughter is dead. No need to trouble the teacher any further. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. When they came to the house, Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered the house, he said to them, Why do you make the commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. They laughed at him. Then he ushered them all outside. He took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Pum, which means, little girl, rise up. Immediately the girl rose up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, her parents were overcome with amazement. Jesus strictly ordered them that no one should know of this. He told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel according to Mark. So maybe after today, we'll see you again on Christmas or maybe even Easter. So, at any rate, uh, I'm Sean, and I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me back. Um, when my father was growing up in the 60s, there was no shortage of films he and his friends enjoyed. Uh, but one that stood out above all the rest was the World War II film, The Dirty Dozen, which had a myriad of stars, including John Cassavetes, who was nominated for an Oscar for that role. My dad's friends would often quote the Dirty Dozen to each other and never forgot the film. Fast forward now to when they're all older, they have families of their own, and one of them, Pat, was working at an airport when in walks none other than John Cassavetes. He could hardly contain himself. He went right up to the actor and immediately started quoting just about every single line from the Dirty Dozen right back to him. <laughs> and after a few minutes of this, Cassavetes looked back at Pat and said, I've been in other movies too, you know. <laughs> now I'll be honest, uh, when I first read tonight's Gospel reading from Mark, I was immediately struck by how so many people in the Gospels are identified by something other than their name. In this reading, we're not told the names of the woman who suffered hemorrhages for 12 years, nor of Jairus' 12-year-old daughter. We don't know their names. But we only know them by the conditions that they suffer from. And of course, we're meant to experience the Gospels through the lens of humanity's relationship with Jesus. But I found it a little sad that these two people, we only know by what Christ healed them from, not who they were as human beings. 
Indeed, we as an LGBTQ plus community can recall a time in the not so distant past when we too were identified by a condition which decimated the community rather than be known by who we are as individuals. And it stripped us of our humanity and even our dignity as those who were supposed to do something did nothing to stop the spread and ameliorate all of the suffering that was being felt. And I don't mean COVID. The fact too remains that in this gospel reading, one of the unnamed people is a woman and the other is a young girl, only known by their relationship or interactions with men. This can serve as an unfortunate reminder of how 2,000 years later, women still have their identity defined uh, by what their bodies are capable of, of their bodily autonomy, of how they define their own womanhood, and whether that matches their gender assigned at birth, and in their proximity to the male gaze. That's gaze, G-A-Z-E, not G-A-Y-S. <laughs> Uh, and this is true for many people in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. They're countless, they're unnamed, but yet without them, the ministry of Jesus would be just a footnote of history. Their stories are imperative to Jesus' story, and indeed to our own story. And so we have to ask ourselves for our own lives, a question asked in 1865 by a caterpillar to a little girl, and again in 1978 by a British rock band, who are you? Who are you? Who are we? As individuals, as a community, as a country, as a group of homo sapiens on the same planet? Because to be honest, if we're not the authors of our own lives, then we too are destined to have our stories written or erased by those who don't really know us or by what society dictates without us living with the authenticity of becoming as God created every single person in this room to become. In short, we might run the danger of only being known by one of our many movies, or a movie we'd rather not be known by. In the first reading from the Book of Wisdom, we heard that wisdom holds us to our words and is a witness to our inmost self. It's here that we're called to reflect upon our own inmost nature, which is given by God. For <clears throat> God created all things that they might be. Our words and actions, and especially the latter, are reflections of ourselves. That must also be a reflection of who we are becoming as God created us. <clears throat> now, I would say who God created us to be, but I found in my own experience that life isn't about a fixed destination to reach. It's a constant state of becoming. For if we stop in our development and understanding of who we are, then what more is there but stagnation? And that's not only true for us as individuals, but for us as a community and us as a country. And within that act of growth that we have, which is also an act of love, that we, as stated in the second reading, excel in every respect in faith, discourse, knowledge, and in the love we have for you, for each other and for God who created all of us. So when we walk, when we stroll, when we strut through the world, being our most authentic selves as God created us, we might not know the effect this will have on others to do the same. For every single one of us in this room who is LGBTQ+, we can all recall the first time we bore witness to someone else who was bravely and unabashedly LGBTQ+ which in turn empowered us to do the same for ourselves. And for those of you who are allies of the LGBTQ plus community, your unconditional love and acceptance of us so too empowered us to live our truth openly and let the world bear witness to the fullness of God's creation, which absolutely includes this community. Because as another 38-year-old New Yorker more famous and well-known than me once said, Ooh, there ain't no other way. Baby, we were born this way. <laughs> I think I did it a little bit better. Uh, yet still, there are times in which this can be difficult for us. There are times when we feel discouraged or ashamed, and it doesn't necessarily come from societal backlash of a perceived and not actual threat to traditional family values, uh, nor from a family member who might not accept us 
nor even from violence perpetrated against us because we are living as God made us. But instead, it comes from an internalized hatred of self for being LGBTQ+. We then become an enemy against ourselves, an inner saboteur, as the popular host of a televised drag competition calls it, <laughs> which uh, results in the destruction of otherwise healthy relationships and involvement in destructive relationships, in the hate felt internally being projected onto those who live out their God-given truth, or in seeking to kill that with which in ourselves, with, uh, which within ourselves we have learned to hate. No draconian law against our community is necessary to silence the community when internalized homophobia and transphobia, which is the real sin against God for hating what God has created, is already present. But even in the darkest of times and in those moments of the most intense self-loathing, Jesus, the ultimate ally, with the most unconditional love to give for the whole of humanity, has these words, which are echoed 365 times throughout the Bible by Jesus and by the host of heaven. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of those who try to tell you that God hates you. Do not be afraid of those who actively campaign to limit the freedom you have to exist in this world. Do not be afraid of those who are supposed to love you unconditionally, but fail to do so. Do not be afraid of the limitless power you already have within yourself to shine a light on this world, daring to be different, bearing witness to the rainbow of God's creation. Do not be afraid of becoming who God created you to become. Do not be afraid, because God believes in you before you can even believe in yourself. So don't be afraid. Because though the writers of history books tried to limit the scope of the beauty of humanity by silencing, omitting, or even erasing our stories, and even though there are people today who actively deny access of our existence to the next generation, guess what? We're here. We're queer. And we're loved by God and created in God's image just as much as anybody else. We were there in 1972 when a group of LGBTQ plus Catholics banded together to fight for inclusion in the larger church. We were there in 1969 when Marsha P. Johnson fought back against police brutality. We were there in 1965 when Barbara Giddings organized picket lines in front of Independence Hall. We were there in 1963 when Bayard Rustin organized the March on Washington. We were there in 1933, when the Nazis burned down the Magnus Hirschfeld Institute, which collected studies about our people. We were there in 1866, when Weewa, a two-spirit person, met with President Grover Cleveland. We were there in 1778, when Baron von Steuben trained and led American troops to victory against the British. We were there for every historical period, every time of peace, and every time of war in human history. And we were there when they crucified our Lord. And we're still here. And united, we're not going anywhere. Because united in love and in humanity and in who God created each of us, we will not allow our stories, our lives, our creation to be dictated by, nor controlled by others, nor erased and forgotten by history. Because that is not why God created us. So do not be afraid and have faith because now, this requires some audience participation, so bear with me. Please repeat after me. Happy times. Happy nights. Happy days. Are here again. <laughs> May God bless you and keep you, this community, this country, and this world. Amen. Amen. Amen.